The title of the sermon is going to be, They Have Seen a Great Light. They have seen a great light, and so we'll read our text first, and then we will look at it. Verse 12, Now when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Verse 17, and from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Two topics, I think, that we'll try to tackle in the sermon. The first one is this idea of, uh, this is uh, applicable just in our everyday general life, this shouldn't be happening to me. I'd like to look at that idea, and we're going to use John the Baptist for that idea. And after that one, I would like to look at God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? The nature of God's righteousness. And we'll do that by seeing uh, the fact that He is sending someone to rescue Israel. That's what we're going to look at. So number one, let's start with the first one. The idea that this shouldn't be happening to me. We come to that in our text and... uh, can only imagine from John's perspective, let's talk about what happened to John and why he must have questioned things don't seem to be going right. Things don't seem to be going right. My future doesn't look the way I imagined that it would look. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. And what happens during those moments in life when we sit there and think to myself, this is not what I signed up for. This is not the way I envisioned my children going. This is not the way I envisioned my finances going. This is not what should be happening to me. I'm a good person. I love God. And so hopefully we can glean some discernment from John's own little weakness here. Now, John had baptized Jesus. And when we look at the Gospel of John, if you want to turn with me, we'll look at John chapter 1. And if you look at the Gospel of John, he kind of gives us a little bit more of a day-by-day explanation of what happened in John's life. So let's look. John chapter 1, we'll start in verse 27. And we're going to look at basically three days in the life of John where after Jesus' baptism, it seems like Jesus uh, sort of is hanging around the Jordan for a little while, because for several days, John is making multiple uh, vis- uh, uh, multiple times that he sees Jesus and points to Jesus. So we get the idea that Jesus hung around for a little while. Let's start with uh, this verse, John 1 and verse 27. This is after Jesus' baptism. Uh, John was saying that the one that comes after me the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. What we learn from this is John knew very well that his ministry was going to be temporary. His ministry was preparatory for the main minister that was to come, the main prophet that was to come, and that was Jesus. So this reveals John knew, hey, there's somebody that's coming after me that is so much more important to me that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals, a little bit of uh, uh, Hasidic background to that, the idea of not being able to untie someone's sandal. A rabbi, when he had his disciples, a rabbi was able to ask his disciples or command that his disciples do a lot of whatever it was that he wished. So he had a lot of authority over his disciples. But there was something uh, in the Jewish understanding that one thing that a rabbi could not ask his disciples to do 
is to say, come here and untie my shoes for me. Untie my sandals for me. That was considered such a menial task that only a servant would do something like that. So a rabbi would never ask that of his disciples. So what John is doing here is revealing to us, John very well knew his place in the plan of God. And he's saying what God is going to do after me, what Jesus is going to do after me is so much more important than my ministry that I am not even worthy, not even able to untie his sandals. So John was very clear about the importance of Jesus. But I'm also wondering, John also knew that his time would come to an end. And so if you try to put yourself in John's position, hey, you're going to announce the Messiah. <clears throat> and then when the Messiah shows up, your job's going to be done. Now, most of you, when you hit that magic age, when your work years are over, what do you look forward to? You're looking forward to retirement. You're looking forward to what comes next. What happens after this stage in my life? And so I'm reading between the lines, but I'm trying to put myself in John the Baptist's place. Hey, once Jesus comes, my role is done. So what was John's idea of retirement, do you think? Once Jesus gets here, He's going to give us the message. He's going to be the King. He's going to be the Lamb that takes away our sins. And I wonder what John thought of his future. I assume that he would have thought that his future would be great. Maybe he's going to build a house up on uh, the Mount of Olives and have himself a good view of Jerusalem and the temple. And he's going to sit back and be excited about Jesus bringing all of Jerusalem together and conquering armies and conquering Rome and Maybe John thought that he was going to get to sit back and enjoy the view. But that's not the way John's life works out. On the second day, if we keep going, verse 29, uh, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John has been equipped to recognize who Jesus is, to recognize the Messiah, and also to recognize this is the one that's going to free Israel of their sins. As a matter of fact, he's going to free the whole world of its sins. Verse 32, about halfway through verse 32, and John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and I saw it remain on Jesus. And verse 34, I have seen this and I have borne witness to this. This guy is the Son of God. Now that's only day two, and John has assured the multitude, assured the people, proclaimed and cried out loud, this is the guy that we've been waiting for. On the third day, when we go to the next day, verse 35. Verse 35, the next day, Again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus and as he walked by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. One would think that John must have really had his act together. He knew what was going on. He knew what was happening. He knew his tiny little place in God's eschatologic plan, and he also knew that his time would be done with. He was uh, so dedicated to God that he lived out in the wilderness. He didn't even come into the plush, comfortable regions of Jerusalem. Uh, the man wore uh, like a, a Tarzan suit made out of camel hair, and the guy ate bugs out in the desert, and you'd think this guy is really sold out for God. This guy really has an understanding and a commitment. He's been given uh, God's Holy Spirit to be able to recognize the Messiah. But then something happens that shouldn't be happening. We look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 18. Uh, by this time, John the Baptist has been put in jail by Herod. The text says... Uh, when the text says that he was put in jail, it actually says that he was betrayed. Somebody ratted out John and handed him over to the Roman officials. It's the same word used when Jesus was betrayed in the garden. He was ratted out and he was handed over. So somebody handed John over and now he's in jail. And you can imagine at that point, John might start questioning, wait a second. 
this is not supposed to be happening to me. I was supposed to have a, I was doing my job for God and I was going to get done with my job when the Messiah comes and I've got plans. I've got other plans. This is not supposed to be happening to me, but he ends up in jail. And so John from jail begins to question. And this is strange about the story, but let's look at it. Luke chapter 7 and verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him and John calling on two of his disciples, he sent them to the Lord to say, are you the one that was supposed to come? Or should we be looking for somebody else? There is something very painful, <clears throat> something very painful about John's statement. John undeniably and without question had been pointing out the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the one that takes away the sins of the world, the new King, the one that the Holy Spirit landed on, the one that the voice of God said, yes, this is my Son. And when things start to go bad for John, all of a sudden he becomes very human and very relatable. And John goes, uh-oh, was I wrong? Things don't seem to be going the way they're supposed to go. And John got shaken in his faith. I bet you many of us can relate to that. That's why I think his story is important. Dude, this was not my retirement plan. My 401k just took a major nosedive. This is not what I expected to happen. And the other part of this story that's kind of interesting is Jesus didn't drop everything and go rescue John out of jail either. What am I trying to get to? I'm trying to get to this sense that each of us needs to come to in our faith. I don't know if stoic is the right word, but irregardless of how things transpire in our life, irregardless of if things begin going and we begin saying, hey, this is not what I planned. That there needs, that, that, that it, it's inevitable, it's a concern that we might be shaken just like John and begin to doubt. Wait a second, wait a second. But God calls us, Jesus calls us to be more stoic than that. He says, hey, no matter what happens to you, don't lose your faith. I'm always with you. In fact, he said, be prepared. There's one place where Paul says, hey, just be glad that you haven't had to uh, endure to the point of shedding your blood. Yet, there needs to be a resolution in us irregardless of how things turn out. Jesus had talked about this. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus had done a lot of work to prepare His disciples to say, Things are not going to go the way you would expect for them to go, but you need to hold on to your faith and you need to be faithful until the very end. Jesus, matter of fact, for, for all practical purposes, said the following, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Don't think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I haven't come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, verse 36, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves their father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. Whoever loves their sons or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. We should take John's shock as an example for us that we always want to be cultivating our faith. Having a good prayer life, having a good uh, reading life, and, and making sure that we're asking ourselves, if a windfall should come, if something should happen that rattles my cage, do I have the steadfastness of heart? Am I grounded well enough 
that even if one of my parents gets mad at me for my faith in God, for, for my proclamation of walking in righteousness, even if my sibling gets mad, even if my peers get mad, am I prepared to do the right thing irregardless of all of that? Jesus says that's where your head needs to be. We need to be working at our faith so that God is the most important priority to us, so that Jesus and His words and His commandments are the most important thing to us, because He said, if you're not willing to exalt Me over some of the people that are the closest to you in your life, you're not going to be worthy of Me. That's a very high calling. That's a very high calling. It shouldn't be strange to us because any athlete has probably at some point had a coach in their career that says, hey, if you're not here on time, if you're not giving me 100%, if you're not giving me 110%, then maybe you're on the wrong team, right? We've all had people that have pushed us. And that's what Jesus is doing. America is getting rocked. We're seeing stuff. Uh, stock market's not doing well. People's 401ks may not be doing well. But it's a warning to us that even John got rattled. Even John wondered. And so we need to protect ourselves from that. There's an old uh, exercise adage. Um, it says, stay in shape so you don't have to get in shape. Stay in shape, be exercising, be taking care of yourself because it's easier to stay in shape than it is to be way over here out of shape and have to work at getting yourself over here where you need to be. Stay in shape so you don't have to get in shape. And I'm saying that we want to apply that to our faith. Let's make sure that we're on solid ground, prayer, Bible study. And God says, if you don't have the wisdom on how to do something, Pray to God about it. Ask God for that kind of faith. Scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith chapter, and the, the faith chapter is all about you need to be able to hold on to your faith irregardless of what you're seeing with your eyes, irregardless of what you're hearing with your ears, you need to be able to hold on. And he gives examples, but let's read what he says. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The, the text goes on, but let me just stop right there. It's impossible to please God. Do you understand why that might be? And the whole reason is because you can be turned into Isaiah chapter 55. The whole reason that we have to have faith is because God reveals, I am not like you. My, let's see, my, uh, oh, what's the verse? He says, my weakness is way stronger than your strength. My worst day far outweighs your best day. And so God is going to tell people, you're going to have to have a little faith in me because I know everything. I'm omnipotent. I know the past. I know the future. And so when I say things to you, I'm saying them for your benefit. And you may not always understand why I'm giving you the rule that I'm giving you because you are not like me is what God has said. So let's look at Isaiah 55. We'll start in verse 7. We'll start in verse 7. Let the wicked man forsake his own way and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that he can have compassion and to our God because he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Verse 9, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways 
and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It would do us well to dwell on that section of text for a while. That is why this faith needs to come into play because if God shows up and says, I want you to make a boat, that may not make sense to Noah. It may not make sense to anybody in the rest of the world. But it's faith that goes, but God is God and I'm going to do what He tells me to. When God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your very first son. That doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? This is not where I should be in life. This is not what I was planning for my future. But God has a will. And he says, the only way you're going to be able to please God is to let go of whatever it is that you think is the right thing to do and to learn to embrace what God has suggested is the right thing to do. You know, uh, one thing that we ought to catch ourselves in is sometimes when we're pondering the things of God, sometimes when we're pondering uh, some of the issues going on in the church, Often the conversation gets started by saying, what do you think? And I hope that you guys will make this little adjustment and be quick to jump back to Isaiah 55 whenever you hear someone say that because God has said, well, it doesn't matter what I think because I'm not like you. God says, you are not like me. So it doesn't matter what people think. What we need to be doing is, hey guys, what does God say about this issue? Does anybody know any scriptures that we can look at to see if we can problem solve this issue? This issue may not be exactly specifically in the Bible, but does anybody have any insights into some scriptures that we can go back to that we can learn from so that we can draw discernment about the issue that we're working through right now. Let's remember to do that. What do you think? Oh, God said it doesn't matter what you think because He is not like you. His ways are higher than your ways. So let's make sure we remember this text. Part two that was, what about when things don't go the way they're supposed to go? That's our little lesson from John the Baptist. Part two is about God's righteousness. The text is about they have seen a great light. Let's read this. This part is going to tell us a little bit about God's righteousness. What does God's righteousness mean? It means, how does God work? Throughout time, how does God do things? And the understanding is God always does the right thing. God always keeps His promise. God is always consistent. And so that's the idea of God's righteousness. Uh, let's read this text and let's understand the history of it. Back to Matthew chapter 4. We'll look at verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, He went and He lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's, that's the district we're going to look at. Hold on to those two names, Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah could be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling there in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region, a shadow of death, and the shadow of death on them a great light has dawned. What is that all about? Well, that text is all about God keeping a promise to this area. And just to make things simple, I'm going to call it the area of Galilee. It's also the 10 northern tribes of Israel. All kinds of ways we could call that. But the area of Galilee, since that's where Jesus goes, God is keeping a promise that was made through Isaiah that one day I'm going to come back to this region and I'm going to shine a bright light in this region so that they can return to me, so they can be reconciled back to me. But we want to understand the history of that region 
and whatever went wrong in that region, and why did God promise, one day I'll send a great light to this region? Matthew is revealing Jesus is that great light, and it's exactly that reason that Jesus goes to Galilee is to fulfill this promise. So let's understand what it is about. Uh, I gave you a little bitty map. I don't want to overwhelm you with too many details, guys, but if you can work your way up to that tiny little Sea of Galilee in the middle, it looks like, uh, what's the word, East Manasseh? Something, I can't even see it from here. East Manasseh, and then you've got the big green section that says Manasseh, and then you've got uh, right above there is Naphtali, and the other place. That's the little area, and that's exactly where Jesus goes to have his ministry. There's a history there. That whole area, I'm just going to refer to it as the Northern Ten Tribes. That's a little easier to hold on to that. There's a lot of names that I don't want to overwhelm you with. The Northern Ten Tribes, what's the history of that area? And how is Jesus going there fulfilling God's promise? Well, first of all, let's remember that these lands were divided up by Joshua. If we go back, Leviticus chapter 25, uh, the land that God gave to Israel was divided up by Joshua. And there's something very important that Leviticus 25 and verse 23 tells us. We often make the mistake, according to this verse, to say that God gave Israel the land. But what this text tells us, let's see if there's a, a, a nuance of difference in the text. Uh, the land may not be sold in perpetuity, forever. That means forever. You're not allowed to give it away to somebody else because the land is mine, says God. You are strangers and sojourners with me. That's a fascinating text. God has made it clear to Israel, I'm the owner. I'm the landlord. And you guys are just foreigners living on my land. It's important that we hold on to that because so many times, even today, over in Israel, they're saying, God gave us this land. This land is our land. And that's not what God ever said in the Scripture. God said, this is my land. You guys are foreigners. I'm allowing you to live here as long as you obey my commandments and follow my statutes. I'm the landlord. You're the tenant. And the agreement is you can be here as long as you follow my commandments and my statutes. So it's not quite correct for them to be saying, this is our land, you better give it back to us because this is ours. No, it was always God's land and you only got to live there as long as you behave the way God wanted you to behave. Hundreds of years later, well, let's go back to the story. Uh, that, that area was completely lost to the Assyrians. If you'll remember, we've talked about that in the past. Uh, the northern ten tribes of Israel were wicked. That was also the time period that we call Ephraim and Shiloh when the tabernacle was there. Those ten tribes, and they were wicked and idolatrous, so God brought Assyria in and He exiled and destroyed the people and took them out of that land that we were just now looking at, including Naphtali and the other one. So God let the Assyrians take His people out of there for rebellion. Let's look at, and then he makes this promise, but one day I will send a light to Galilee. I will send someone to reconcile you to myself. Let's look at what happened, how things went wrong. They were being idolatrous. Uh, the period of, of that territory goes all the way back to roughly Moses, all the time in the wilderness when the people were rebellious, the time when God said, go into the promised land, but they were afraid to go in. Uh, the times when they grumbled because they were hungry and they were thirsty, so on and so forth. God sends prophets to warn that area. Let's look at Hosea chapter 11 and verse 3. God says, I was good to you. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but, I did not, but they did not know that I healed them. 
I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaw, and I bent down to them, and I fed them. God says, I took care of you. I showed you favor for this whole period of time. I think it was roughly a thousand years. Uh, 1,400, 700, maybe it was only 700 years. I think that's more correct. Moses was around 1400 B.C. Uh, the Assyrians came in and destroyed that area around 700 B.C. So God put up with rebellious people for 700 years. But uh, the psalmist starts giving us insights into why God, ang God got angry with these people. Psalm 78 and verse 42, they did not remember His power or the day when He redeemed them from the foe when He performed His signs in Egypt and His marvels in the fields of Zoan. The fields of Zoan is where Moses had his uh, bout with the magicians of Pharaoh, and Moses did all the miraculous signs of God there. And God says, they forgot everything that I did for them. They were rebellious, and so God says, I'm going to send them prophets. 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 15. Here's what God did to try to bring His people back to Himself. Again and again, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to His people through His messengers because He had compassion on them and on His dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despising His words, scoffing at His prophets until the wrath of the Lord against His people was stirred up beyond any remedy. God kept trying to reach out to this area the area of Galilee, the ten northern tribes, but they persisted in rebellion and hard-heartedness. So here's God's final judgment, Psalm 78 and verse 59. When God heard this, He was full of wrath and He utterly rejected Israel. He forsook His dwelling place at Shiloh and the tent where He dwelt among mankind. Verse 61, and he delivered his power, that is Israel, his favored people, he delivered his power to captivity and his glory, that was probably the Ark of the Covenant that had all of the laws of God in it, his glory to the hand of the foe, that was the Philistines, and he gave his people over to the sword and he vented his wrath on his heritage. And that is when Assyria comes in around the 700s and takes that territory captive, exiles the northern ten tribes, and they're gone and they're never heard from again. Now, it would be pretty depressing to leave the story right there. What happens is in Isaiah's ministry, Isaiah also talks to the northern tribes. And even though destruction is coming on the northern tribes, Isaiah is going to comfort them I don't know how comforting that would be, but he says, one day God is not going to be mad at you any longer. One day God is going to send a light to that area, Galilee of the Gentiles, the Galilee around the sea there. One day God is going to come back to you. God is going to swoop you up again. He's going to send a light to you and He's going to offer to redeem you. And that is the story of God's righteousness. I had to discipline you. I had to be hard on you for your stubbornness and your rebellion. But Isaiah promises that one day I'm going to send you help. I'm going to send you a messenger. And that is the part that Matthew quoted in his scripture. So let me take you to that. Isaiah chapter 9 is what Matthew quotes. Isaiah 9 and verse 1. This is the hope that he's giving the ten tribes that are about to be exiled and wiped out. He says, One day in the future there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. That means in the past, God was hard on you. God disciplined you. God allowed bad things to happen to you. But in the latter time, He has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Verse 2, And the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. 
Matthew is announcing that God is keeping His promise. Though He allowed you to be destroyed, He allowed you to be exiled, He promised that one day He would send you light to reconcile you back to Himself. And now Matthew is telling us that Jesus is that light that Galilee, Naphtali, and Zebulun should rejoice because the day of God's reconciliation is now here. And Matthew tells us Jesus goes up to do His job. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went up and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Jesus has come 700 years after the prophecy to bring the light that God had promised. In this area of Capernaum, uh, it's the same area, Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee, all those names are right in the same area. Jesus changed water to wine at a wedding. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus healed the sick son of a centurion. Jesus healed a madman that was in the synagogue in Capernaum. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of fever. Jesus healed the lepers. Jesus healed the paralyzed man. Jesus was bringing God's favor to Galilee. He also brought a message, Matthew 4 and verse 17 in our text. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now we see that there is a caveat there is a stipulation, there is a condition. Jesus was the promised light to Capernaum, but Jesus' announcement to Capernaum is, you need to repent. You must repent. And so that is Jesus' message to them. He is the light to them. And I wanted to recognize that where Jesus, where God keeps His promise to Capernaum, the message was ineffective on Capernaum. For three years, Jesus preached in the area. For three years, Jesus did miracles in the area. For three years, Jesus taught those people and He preached to them forgiveness, repentance. Uh, it says that uh, Jesus also preached a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, just the same way John the Baptist had done. So Jesus announced the day of God's reconciliation is here. He was hard on you in the past, but today He has brought reconciliation. But the Bible tells us they weren't interested in it. There's something so profound about that, that in God's righteousness, He keeps His promise to come back and make everything right. But when He comes back to make everything right, the people still were not interested in being righteous. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. After Jesus' three-year ministry, after Jesus had come to be the light, Jesus curses this area. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20. Then He began to denounce the cities that were where most of His mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Verse 23, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, they would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than it is for you. 700 years after God used the Assyrians to destroy the northern ten tribes, He also promised, I will send a light to come back and redeem you. 700 years later, Jesus appeared. He goes to Capernaum. He is the light. And yet, unfortunately, He says the people refused to repent. They just weren't interested and so now in 40 years, God will send Rome to destroy the area once again. What happened there? 
Uh, what, what, what was wrong? Was there something wrong with Jesus' message? What was wrong? How come sometimes people just don't respond to God's reconciliation? People can have done wrong in the past. God says, I'll make a way for you. I'm willing to forgive you. And when they have the opportunity to fix what has been wronged, they aren't interested in the fix. And you know, John tells us in that uh, most famous scripture, you can turn to John chapter 3, uh, the most famous scripture in the Bible, John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He sent His Son. We've just witnessed His Son going to Galilee, but we've also witnessed that they rejected His message. Why would anybody do that? Sometimes it just leaves you scratching your head. And so as we work our way through that John 3 section, you got to remember that John 3.16 is not the only verse in chapter 3. That's the beginning statement. God loves the world so much that He sent His Son. But does that automatically fix everything? And He goes on in the rest of the chapter to say no, that doesn't automatically fix everything because there's still a problem with the world. Let's look at that down to verse 19. John 3 and verse 19. This is the judgment. This is the verdict. Here is the sum of all things. So verse 19 is the climax of the chapter. Here's the sum. Light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works or evil, everyone who does wicked things hates the light, doesn't come to the light unless his works might be exposed. There is just an irony in that, that God promised you're going to be living in darkness. I'm going to send the light to you to rescue you. But unfortunately, as we witness in this case, the people living in darkness liked it that way, preferred it that way. And so because they love their evil deeds, they love their evil works, they hate the light that God sent. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, but they decided that they weren't interested in it. Jesus commands us anyway, though, for the church, shine your light anyway. Jesus gives us the commandment, you need to go continue doing what I was doing. I went to be a light. You need to go be a light in a world that is in darkness. A lot of people are going to love the darkness, and you may not be able to tear them away from that. But the Great Commission is, go teach them. Go teach them, go struggle with them, go wrestle with them, open the Bible with them, and don't let the salt lose its saltiness. You be the people that God has asked you to be. Continue being the light, even though you may be living in a world that is full of darkness, and that's exactly the way they like it, and they don't want to change but our commission is to be that light. I hope that's been of interest to you. God's righteousness, God kept His promise to the Jewish nation, but they just weren't interested in it. Uh, let me pray and we'll close out. Father God, what a, a terror it is. What a concern it is, Father, that You are willing to come reconcile mankind to Yourself. You're willing to bring a message of salvation to a world that is full of darkness and the understanding that it may not always be well received, but for us to take up that same mission of Christ, Father, to go out to continue being the lights, to continue being the one that says, this is what God says about that. This is what God says about that. To be that light, to be your voice in our community, Father. Let us learn from Jesus' example that that is our mission, that that is what we are to do, to always be pronouncing light 
in the middle of darkness. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.